This episode of Geek's Guide to the Galaxy is made possible thanks to support from listeners like you. So if you enjoy the show and want it to continue, please sign up to give us a dollar or two per episode over at patreon.com slash geeks. And I want to give a special thank you to Kira Nichols, who just signed up this week to support us on Patreon. Kira writes, I've been listening to Geek's Guide to the Galaxy for many years, possibly even from the beginning, which I've just checked and looks like was in 2010. That's a long time. When I would listen to the podcast, which, by the way, is fantastic, like nothing else out there, I would say to myself, when I earn more money, I'll become a Patreon supporter. While I've had a bit more time to be thoughtful about my expenses lately, and so I've just canceled a subscription service to one of those tech giants currently consolidating their wealth, and I'm going to put that towards supporting Geek's Guide. As soon as I can afford to up my pledge, I will. Thanks for all of your amazing work on the podcast, and for being an independent voice and thinker. I really feel like the value of the podcast goes beyond discussing sci-fi and fantasy, which of course I love, as it also offers thoughtful science-driven reflections on the future and the world we live in, something I don't get from mainstream media. There's nothing like Geek's Guide out there, and I hope to hear it for many more years. So big thanks again to Kieran Nichols for supporting us on Patreon. All right, so now let's get to our show. Wired.com presents The Geek's Guide to the Galaxy. And here is your host, David Barr Kirtley. Hello, and welcome to episode 415 of Geek's Guide to the Galaxy. Today on the show, we'll be discussing live action feature films about characters who first appeared in video games. And this will involve spoilers for the movies that we discuss, so just be aware of that. And I'm joined by three guests. So, first up, we've got Erin Lindsay, making her 18th appearance on the show. She's the author of the Bloodbound series of epic fantasy novels and the Nicholas Lenoir series of paranormal detective novels, which she writes under the name E.L. Tetensor. A Golden Grave, the latest novel in her Rose Gallagher series of historical mysteries, is out now. So, Erin, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. The next up, we've got Zach Chapman, who you may remember from our Listener Strike Back panel in episode 200 our Valerian movie review in episode 266, and our Channel Zero season 2 review in episode 282. His short fiction appears in Nature, Starship Sofa, Tales to Terrify, Steampunk Universe, and Writers of the Future, and he also edited the anthology Time Travel Tales, which includes stories by Catherine Wells, Sean Williams, and Robert Silverberg. So, Zach, welcome to the show. Hi, thanks for having me back. I love being on. And also joining us today is Blake J. Harris who you may remember from our feature interview back in episode 358 and from our panel on the Nintendo Entertainment System back in episode 114. His best-selling book, Console Wars, Sega, Nintendo, and the Battle That Defined a Generation, is currently being adapted for TV by Seth Rogen and Evan Goldberg. Blake's most recent book is The History of the Future, which tells the amazing rags-to-riches story of teenage inventor Palmer Luckey, who co-founded a company worth billions, only to fall victim to internet outrage and corporate backstabbing. So, Blake, welcome to the show. Thank you for having me. Okay, so let's start off with Blake, because, Blake, you were supposed to come out here for South by Southwest to Austin, <laughs> where you're yes. going to be debuting your uh, Console Wars documentary. It was going to be awesome. We were going to hang out, have a great time. Obviously, that didn't happen because of the whole global pandemic thing. So I just wanted to ask you kind of what's going on with Console Wars now. Yeah, that was a interesting situation, a real bummer. Yeah, it, the news came down on a Friday that South by Southwest was being canceled, and I was feeling pretty upset and, uh, you know, a little bad for myself. And then within, like, 72 hours, I realized that there was a lot else going on in the world. Uh, you know, the NBA season was canceled and all sorts of stuff, and people were very sick. And so that was small potatoes compared to everything. But uh, the, the the silver lining to all that was that it gave us about an extra three weeks to finish uh, editing the movie. And uh, we were able to do things we probably wouldn't have been able to do if we were down in Texas, though I would have loved to hang out with you and screen the film. <laughs> um, and uh, and so what's, to answer your question of what's going on, the film uh, prior had been uh, sold to CBS All Access, who is doing the scripted version of the book adaptation. Um, and Seth, and, as you mentioned, Seth and Evan are uh, producing both versions, the documentary and the series. And so uh, I, I don't know yet know the release date. But uh, it is finally all done after seven years, and uh, I'm very happy with it. And uh, and I'll let you know as soon as I have a release date, but hopefully, you know, this summer or this fall. Wow. All right. Definitely. And ev everyone, I guess, uh, subscribe to CBS All Access, so you'll be ready for yeah. Blake's documentary. I'm really excited about that. Thank you. Did you uh, grow up during the console war? 
kind of. I was born in ninety, so yeah. But um, yeah. I wasn't really like super, you know, aware until like I was aware at the later, um, I guess you know, ninety five through two thousand. But I yeah, I read your book. I loved it. Oh, thank you very much. All right, so let's get into some of these movies. So, uh, so Aaron, so when you uh, heard that the topic for this panel was going to be video game movies, what was your initial reaction? Um, my initial reaction was mostly excited. Um, I grew up sort of in the middle of those console wars and was a, a huge, was an M, a huge fan of video games, um, including a lot of video games that have made it to the screen. Also a certain degree of trepidation because I had already seen a number of them um, with sort of mixed quality. And so I knew, that, <laughs> I knew there were going to be some, wait, wait, some what bad movies in my future. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I had, uh, but, you know, we had enough notice for this panel that, uh, that I got to rewatch some of them too, which was, which was kind of a treat, but yeah, I was looking forward to it and looking forward to it also just as a sort of trip down memory lane about some of the games that I used to play, particularly in the nineties and the, in the early O's. Well, I thought it was funny because your email response to me was when you saw the topic initially, you're like, oh, I'm going to have to bow out of this one because I haven't watched that many video game movies. That's then... what I thought. You looked it over turns the list. You're was, like, "Oh, actually, yeah. I've seen like eight of these." Sadly, it's a big lie. <laughs> <laughs> as it turns out, um, I think possibly I just uh, repressed the memory of quite a number of them, <laughs> just sort of scrubbed them right off my hard drive as soon as possible. Hmm. Uh, so, how about Zach? What was your initial reaction to this uh, panel topic? Well, uh, I guess a mix of both, too: um, excitement and. Uh, that uh, I'm gonna have to watch Detective Pikachu and <laughs> Sonic. Um, I'm not the type of person that likes to watch things that are based off of things that I love. Um, I, it, it sounds weird, but uh, like I've never seen the Dune movie because uh, it looked bad. Um, I like that. And, and I love the book. Um, Wait, do you so, love Pikachu? <laughs> yeah, I, I I do. I mean, I grew up. I mean, I'm like the prime audience for Detective Pikachu, um, but I saw the trailer and the t the trailer looked terrible to me. You know, uh, Ryan Reynolds is a talking Pikachu. Um, d just I didn't want to, you know, I didn't go see it. And I I go see like almost all movies. So um, that one I had skipped out on. And then Sonic one, obviously, that one looked very similar uh, in quality and in like the the basic premise. We have like a CG creature with you know, uh, doing the buddy cop thing, um, literally, like in both movies. Um, so I was, I wasn't looking forward to that, but, um, I was looking forward to rewatching uh, these movies that I, you know, grew up as, as a kid watching on repeat, like Mortal Kombat. All right, cool. And so then how about Blake? What was your initial reaction to this panel topic? Uh, I was really looking forward to it, um, you know, partially for the reasons that, that Aaron and Zach mentioned, you know, revisiting these things and, and all that, but also because there's always been this reputation that video game movies don't work and are terrible, and there's certainly examples of the terrible, uh, but I, I mean, I feel like it's more just a situation that, that a lot of movies don't work, and, you know, if you, like, a lot of these have done quite well, especially, like, I, I guess I was really happy in the timing of this, because with... Detective Pikachu and Sonic and Rampage and and you know there's a lot of movies that have that are beloved and have done well financially and I feel like there's a lot of people always have this caveat like when Rampage did well you know it made almost a uh, half a billion dollars and people are like oh well, that one wasn't really a video game movie and then Sonic and Pikachu come out and those do well and it's like oh those are more like kid movies but you know at some point you have to stop adding these caveats and saying well video game movies can do well not always and certainly there's been a lot of stinkers but like it's a, I, I so i was just really happy that we would have the opportunity to acknowledge that there are ups and downs and that it's not all downs and that and that it is, does pretty well i mean did any of these movies like actually lose money uh for sure well super mario brothers lost like 20 million dollars <laughs> right. <laughs> right but that's i mean that's like one out of like the eight or ten that we watched I think a lot of these did, they either earned their budget back or they did pretty well. Yeah, well, yeah, I, no, I think you're right. Yeah, Resident Evil certainly did well because they made five more. So, uh, 
<laughs> I mean, I guess Warcraft especially did bad, and there hadn't been, up until recently, there hadn't been too many, like, runaway absolute successes, though they all consistently had sort of made money. I mean, Mortal, Com Mortal Kombat did really well financially, I heard. Mm -hmm. But so. how much could that possibly have cost? <laughs> Let, let's be real here. But yeah, so so I don't know. It may be that um, many of these movies, I didn't actually look up the box office for all of them, but um, it may be that many of them did well financially. But one thing that they did not do well in was critical reception. Because if you look at these scores on Rotten Tomatoes, only Detective Pikachu, Sonic the Hedgehog, Rampage, and the new Tomb Raider are above 50%. And so all the other ones are below 50%. Most of them way, way, way below fifty percent. So, uh, so I yeah, I feel like that's kind of the the elephant to the room that we need to address to start yeah, off. Yeah, and, and also again, just like notably, those are the four that you mentioned are like basically the last four video game movies. So it seems yeah. to be an upper trend, which is why I was happy that we were doing this now. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, that would be a real bummer if we did this in twenty seventeen. <laughs> <laughs> um, Will the new game movies ever work? But yeah, but so do you. Blake, do you feel that the movies are are critics being unduly harsh to these movies, or do you think that they're just really have been pretty disappointing artistically overall? I mean, artistically, so I guess prior to 2017, uh, I think that artistically, the, some of the ones I've seen, they were sort of disappointing, but that was also like, uh, they were made sort of for their audience, um, and what I mean by that is kind of like, I don't know, Happy Gilmore at the time, I feel like was critically, was a critical bomb, even though it, everyone I knew who watched it loved it because it was for young people and immature people. And yeah. I feel like... Even similar, though when I was in college, think, you watched it literally every week. <laughs> yeah. But like, I mean, I don't think the New York Times wrote about like how clever <laughs> it was and how fresh it was, even though it was a, it was it accomplished what it wanted to do and it made money and i feel like that's true of a lot of the movies on here especially the ones from the 90s uh, that i saw when i was growing up like street fighter and mortal kombat like they gave me everything i wanted in the movie now obviously that was not true for all of them like super mario brothers was terrible and we'll get into that but um you know i think that uh, they i think that the reputation is is a little bit unfair um and that for the most part, uh, looking back, I, I was kind of surprised and, and impressed with uh, the quality of some of these movies. Yeah, quality I mean, of these Aaron, movies. Uh, I mean, Aaron, you were saying over email that you thought that the critics were being too hard on these movies. Um, I said that I thought that the tomato scores were not very uh, reliable barometers from my perspective of whether these movies were good or bad. Um, but of course, tomatoes separates the the critic score, meaning somebody who's a blogger or a media critic of some kind versus the audience score. And in a lot of cases, there is a divergence. Um, and I think in some cases, I was left wondering whether um, whether the, the audience score in part reflected, going back to something Zach said, reflected a sort of disappointment um, from the core audience of, you know, for example, Warcraft strikes me as a good candidate for this is a game that's incredibly popular globally. People probably had very high expectations uh, by people. I mean, sort of audience members as opposed to critics per se had high hopes slash expectations of what Warcraft could and should deliver as a film and, and didn't feel that it lived up to that. Um, and I wonder how much of that uh, factors into it equally like the, the audience for something like Tomb Raider um, depending on what demographic I, I had the feeling that that one just as, a, as an example uh, the, the demographic that sort of grew up playing Tomb Raider is not necessarily who they were aiming that movie at and that disconnect hurt them I think in terms of their tomato rating so for me, it was a little bit all over the place. It's incomprehensible to me that Rampage scored above 50%, for example, like roughly the same as, as the Tomb Raider film, the, which I thought was objectively just a better movie, for example. Yeah. See, Zach, were you going to say something? Um, yeah, I agree, especially on the point about Warcraft. Um, that movie, what was it, like 20-something percent? Yeah, 28%. Um, yeah, I think these are all bad movies, like, critically. I can't say that one of them is good, um, except for Silent Hill. I will say that. Um, but, uh, yeah, I still enjoy them. 
I still have fun watching them, even though I can critically look at them and say, uh, all right, you know, uh, <laughs> this is not, this is not well-written. This is horribly acted. The pacing is terrible, but, um, but yeah, especially Warcraft it wasn't being a recent bad. movie, it was, it was pretty to look at. Like it was, I mean, <laughs> in the first 15 minutes of the movie, we're like, we go all over the place and there's like a million different locations, but it, once you settle into it, you know, I, I was digging it. I mean, it's a simple plot. <laughs> doesn't seem so at first, but it is, you know, it is. All right. Well, let's just talk about Warcraft then. Cause, um, I, I played a lot of Warcraft too. I've never played World of Warcraft or any MMOs. Um, so I had, I didn't have any particular expectations going into this movie. Uh, when it first started and every, it's all in the orc world and it all just looked like a video game trailer. And I was kind of like, wait, I thought this was a live action movie. Like this is going to be really ugly when this, these orcs start interacting with actual live actors. Uh, and it was never great. I didn't think the, um, the integration of the live actors with the CGI, but it was okay. I kind of got used to it after a while. And, um, you know, there's so few good epic fantasy movies that I was willing to cut this one a lot of slack just because it was like, you know, set in a fantasy world with all the all the special effects and accoutrements and everything. Um, I thought there was really only one scene that really I thought was effective, but I thought it was pretty effective, which is where there's the the leader of the knights and um, they're being they're sort of trapped in this um, canyon and he calls on the wizard to create a shield to protect them from the orcs so that they can flee. And his son gets trapped on the other side of the magical barrier. And so he just sees him kind of getting cut down by orcs and there's nothing he can do. I was like, wow, this is really kind of like getting me. But um, other than that, I, I wasn't super impressed with the movie. But um, I know, Blake, did you, what did you think of Warcraft? Did you see Warcraft? Yeah, I saw Warcraft. Um, I'm, I'm probably like the worst person the, the the opposite of the target audience because um you know it, it lives it's on that spectrum with like lord of the rings and i i didn't i didn't i never liked the lord of the rings movies i i don't i i um so i don't know i i i watched it for this podcast and it was better than i expected i'm sure the expectations played a role um i mean the two things that come to mind partially based on our you know one based on our previous discussion is uh the, just the Rotten Tomato scores. I, I, it still baffles me why that is like often used as a barometer for movies. I, it, by design, it's you know not saying whether something is really good or really bad. It's just whether you know what percentage of people said it was you know better than bad or you know good, <laughs> which is a weird way. I know it's become the norm uh, for like a lot of you know certified fresh is a big deal for studios to post um but then, you know the but, thing but there's so, not really any other kind of um st uh, standardized measuring system is there or there's no, metacritic no, no. Yeah. yeah i mean i guess i feel like metacritic i i prefer metacritic um and then also i just prefer <laughs> hearing actual reviews like the, th this is what the critic system is and this is what people seem to like about it um but I understand, just for the standardization's sake. Uh, but the weird, though, I guess you know, I'm I'm always very interested in the the behind the scenes, the making of stuff. Um, and so this movie is so interesting because it 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 did relatively very poorly in the United States, but it made almost four hundred million dollars compared. You know, it made forty seven. It says forty seven million dollars in the U.S. and it made three hundred ninety one million dollars overseas. Why do you guys think that is? Why did it do so well elsewhere that it almost you know, China really, China really likes big CGI battles. <laughs> I I don't know. I think that's like a big. Yeah, part no, of I, it. I remember reading that as part of it because I, I, I'm uh, my recollection is that it came out and it got such bad reviews and it did so bad its opening week in the box office here and people were talking about like what a flop it is and then like within a week people sort of pulled back from that because it was doing so well in China. I didn't realize it did this well. Um, I. I yeah. I think that's part of it. I, I suspect, I mean, how, how well a movie does at the box office is, is too always influenced by some of those wild cards, like what else opens on the same weekend and what else is going on um, in the general environment. But I, I wonder if it also points to a certain degree to, to what I was saying, which is um, that there might be like that, that Rotten Tomatoes score and that failure at the box office might reflect to a certain degree disappointment among Warcraft fans um, who would be more numerous in some markets than in others. Um, the United States would obviously be a huge market for that game. And if word went around that the Warcraft fandom 
that th- this movie was crap, um, then then I think that would definitely influence it. Um, and I, I I have to think that that's that's playing a role in terms of the scores because as I said, like I don't I would never argue that it's that it's a good movie. I wouldn't send anybody out to see it who wasn't already either a, a hardcore epic fantasy fan or a hardcore Warcraft fan. And frankly, even then, but I don't think it merited the score it got in relation to some of these other movies. And so, yeah, it's pure speculation on my part, but I am convinced that the, um, and one of the things that I dislike about crowdsourcing reviews in general is that it opens them up to this kind of bombing that you get um, right. when a fandom gets toxic about something. Well, and you, I mean, you're like the perfect example because it sounds like from talking to you that, you know, the movie was, you know, probably between, between deserved between like a 40 and 60% out of 100, but you would give it, uh, you know, you, you, you said it was bad. So if there was a hundred use, it would get a zero. Like, but you're not saying that it's that bad of a movie, you know? Yeah. I mean, I definitely would give it a splat, but it would be like a 46% <laughs> splat as right. opposed to a single digit splat, well, which some right. people... Well, so, so you say, you say, Aaron, that you wouldn't like send anybody out to see this and I wouldn't really send anybody no. out to see any of these movies. I mean... The one I like the best is Resident Evil, which I'll get into. I kind of, which I actually kind of love. But even that one, still, I wouldn't say you got to go see it. I mean, you could probably go on Netflix and just pick stuff at random and find something better. But Mm -hmm. um, you know, so but I I guess I'm just curious. Does anyone feel maybe Zach about Mortal Kombat that 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 any of these movies you would actually say you got to go out and see this one? Uh, yeah. I mean, Mortal Kombat. (laughs) (laughs) Um, I mean, and even. I would say that about Detective Pikachu and Sonic just because so many of my friends are like, you got to see this movie. And I was like, I'm not going to see that. It looks like shit. But I know a ton of my friends like it. So, you know, I would I would recommend it with a caveat that, you know, eh, it's not really for me. But so yeah, I, lo- I love both of those. I would totally recommend and have recommended people to watch to spend a Friday night watching Detective Pikachu or especially Sonic. And I know I'm a little, I have soft spot for Sonic, but I thought it was really, thought it was great. I loved the mix of live action and animation. I loved the change that they made to the character uh, design after there was some, uh, <laughs> you know, my background in internet outrage, uh, David. Uh, yeah. But I thought, and I thought Ben Schwartz was awesome as the voice and I loved Jim Carrey as the over the top villain. Well, let's just explain that in case people missed that story. So um, the initial trailer for the Sonic movie, you know, it's it's one of these things where it's weird where you're bringing this kind of cartoon character into a live action movie. And right. they went a little too far in the initial design and trying to make him look like he actually would exist in the real world. So they made him look like more like an actual hedgehog than the right. cartoon version. And it was just really like Uncanny Valley, disconcerting, like super, super creepy. And, and like specifically, I remember people were like very like they kept pointing to like his legs. His legs looked like actual like human runner <laughs> legs, um, and not like the cute, adorable little you know blue blur guy that people remembered from the games. Yeah, so they actually redid all the Sonic uh, special effects to make him look more like a cartoon character, which I think was definitely the the right way to go. Um, but it does sort of point to this problem that. Uh, uh, like I was saying with the Warcraft movie too, of how do you get these video game characters into live action and have them not still look like they don't match the live action. Um, But you can, and you can make a thing out of that. And I, and I would point to a a pioneer in that area of who framed Roger Rabbit. And I think as much as I liked detective Pikachu, I wanted more Roger Rabbit. That being said, um, I realized that I think Detective Pikachu was aiming at, at a at a younger audience than that. Um, but I mean, I don't know if you want to get into specifically discussing those two movies yet. But but I think the point that I'm making is that you you don't even really try. You kind of lean into the fact that that you're not you're not playing in the same world here. That you have cartoon characters interacting with real people or you have so for like it wouldn't work for warcraft for example you would you want a seamless integration there but for something like sonic or detective pikachu where the the character is the video game character is not supposed to be sort of of this world or is supposed to be very different from humans then i don't personally see any need to stitch them together too much i think that's a great point 
I, yeah, I, I would have loved, even though, I, like I said, I recommend both movies, but I would have loved to get more into like the subculture and sort of like the otherworldliness of, of, of Sonic or of Pikachu in the Roger Rabbit sort of way that you're talking about. Yeah, I kind of, I feel like I disagree because I want to see like an adaptation. Like, I don't want to see this stark contrast with our world and whatever, you know, the Pokemon world or the Sonic world. I mean, if you're going to do Roger Rabbit, do Roger Rabbit. If you're going to adapt a video game, adapt a video game. Don't, like, create a buddy cop movie, you know? I mean, that's, like, philosophically what I want to see in the future. Like, if they're going to sure. be doing... If they're going to be doing adaptations, adapt the fucking source material. Like, don't... <laughs> yeah. just, just do if you're gonna do that, do Wreck It Ralph. I mean, those are great movies, but they're not Wreck It Ralph's not called you know Sonic, even though. Well, that, that's what, I'm really glad you brought up Wreck It Ralph because it hadn't occurred to me. But that of all the movies on this list, though they all pale in comparison to that. That is probably the most successful video game movie of all well, time. No, no we're only hilarious. talking about live action. Right, right, right. But I'm saying, and it's funny that that's not based on like an existing IP, I, not live I, action I, either. Yeah. <laughs> two, two points. One, uh, I think the best video game movies ever made are not based on actual video games. And two, uh, going back to, to Zach's point, like I agree with you, Zach, when it comes to Sonic, I would not have gone the buddy cop route with that at all. Um, I would have liked to see Sonic the Hedgehog in Sonic's world doing Sonic's things. Um, but, and I've never played Pokemon and I, and I specifically haven't played Detective Pikachu, but in, in that second case, I believe there is a Detective Pikachu game, no? Yes. So, so, yes. so, I mean, they're, they're not, they're not coloring outside the lines on well, that one, I don't yeah, think. Yeah, I'm not an, I'm not a Pikachu expert either, but in the Pokemon, it is like humans interacting with the Pokemons, right? So yeah. it's not yeah. like Sonic where, the the humans is like unlike the games. I mean, it's True. pretty unlike the games. Like, the game has two concepts. You train Pokemon, which you either do it in gym battles or in the wild against wild Pokemon or against friends, your friends in real life, and you collect Pokemon by trading them and catching them or whatever. There's none of that in the the movie. In fact. They go so far as to when I looked up, looked it up on IMDb in the city that they're in, it's illegal to do trainer battles. And like, there's only one scene of someone catching a Pokemon and it's like, and it fails. It's like right off the bat. So there's only one Pokeball. I don't know. It's just like, <laughs> it, it does, it does diverge. I mean, I'm, I'm still like in awe. Like my six year old self is like, I got to see these amazing. Pokemon brought to real life these, you know, Blastoise fighting Gengar and Snorlax in the middle of the street, even though he should have been like 10 times bigger than he was. You know, I'm still like gushing over that, but come on, like, make an adaptation. Don't, why is Ryan Reynolds a, a Pikachu? Like, do you have a problem with Ryan Reynolds? Because if you do, this is going to get ugly. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, I. He's I a like national treasure, Zach. <laughs> Concur with that, yeah. I just have a problem with him being a CGI creature when, you know, that's not, like, Have you played really the Detective Pikachu game? I actually haven't. I've, I've played every, like, I've played every uh, entry in the main series. Right. And I think the only reason I'm on this review is because last time I was at David's, Someone brought a little kid over, and I saw he was playing Pokemon, and I was teaching him how to play Pokemon. I was like, you need to use this Pokeball to catch that guy. All right, I feel like we're getting a little too deep into the yeah. weeds on Pokemon here. But I want to ask Blake a question about Sonic the Hedgehog. So I never played Sonic the Hedgehog, so I always just saw all the marketing, which made me think that Sonic was this total, like, punk, mischievous, sarcastic, rebel, badass kind of character. Mm -hmm. And so I, in the movie, I felt like he was more of just like a lovable goofball and not like as like brash and like attitude as I would have expected. I was just curious what you what you make of that. Yeah, that's an interesting point that you make, because I think that part of the uh, 
part of what impresses me with what Sega was able to do, specifically Sega of America was able to do with Sonic back in the early 90s, was that they were able to have their cake and eat it too. That he was this brash rebel that was like, you know, stood the, the face of the pirate ship of Sega as opposed to, you know, squeaky clean Nintendo. But at the same time, they did have two Saturday morning cartoons where Sonic was exactly the version that you're talking about, like the adorable, or not that you're talking about, but like the one that's in the movie, kind of like an adorable cutesy character. And, you know, usually you, you can't be a punk and also uh, adorable. And, uh, and and I think it was a wise direction that they went for the movie. Um, I think you know part of the other backdrop to what we were talking about earlier with people reacting to uh, how the uncanny valley of how Sonic looked in the initial trailer or poster art um, was that Detective Pikachu came out in the middle of that and did really well, and and also seemed to be like uh, beloved by a lot of people. And I think that that was a big influence too to why they sort of you know shifted Sonic from the spiky. Um, you know, punkish character to more of a of a of a goofy. I guess he was a sidekick in the movie, but like just like a goofy, uh, adorable character. Yeah, because I mean, the bo- I thought both these movies, Sonic and Pikachu, were enjoyable, but they were way more kid movies than I was expecting. Yeah. And I was right. I would have wanted something more like Ted, the like um, obscene teddy bear movie. You know, I was right. I mean, not for Pikachu necessarily, but for for Sonic, I was imagining something a little with a little bit more edge than than what but, we got. I mean, yeah, but see, I, it's, it's that's funny to me because like they were both always going to be kids movies, I think. Um, and, and as much as Sonic in the video games had this rebellious streak, it was very much a G rated rebellious streak. <laughs> that's true. It, that's it always true. was. I mean, this is a very cartoony game in the sort of uh, um, in the Super Mario in the Mario Brothers vein. Uh, you know, your your objective is to is to free cute baby animals from a ridiculous looking guy with a giant mustache who flies around in robots. So, I mean, it was it's a it's a kid's property in that sense, in in terms of the sensibility. It, it actually feels more like a like a Nintendo game than a Sega game if you sort of compare it to the universe of what those two platforms were doing. I mean, I don't know, Blake, if you agree, but Nintendo has always had a kind of a niche for itself in your in your sort of uh, Super Mario, um, what's another one? What's that one? Pikmin. I loved Pikmin. Anyway, all of those sort of very deliberately cutesy, even though they weren't necessarily meant to be played by children, that aesthetic was very much there. And I think Sonic always fit into that category. So he might have been cheeky in the way Bart Simpson circa 1991 (laughs) was cheeky. But not really genuinely cheeky at any point. Wasn't it only just really in the marketing, right? Like... Like yeah, those edginess. are all really good points. I think it, okay, it was largely in the marketing, and then also two other things. It was like the toe tap. Like if you don't move the controller after a few seconds, Sonic. Oh yeah, that's right. I forgot about that. <laughs> Which is like a real thing because like Mario would never be like, "Come on, guy!" Like that was like a real <laughs> just... thing that Sonic. And then also just like comparing Mario to Sonic. Like even today, when I play Mario games on the you know on the Switch, like Mario is like a slow moving plumber, and it's like very exploratory. There's, you know, not like fast surprises, and Sonic is like a pinball game where it's like yep. boom, 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 boom all over the place. So I don't know that that makes him like rebellious at all, but it does make like a contrast between the typical like you know Kirby, even Legend of Zelda game where you're slowly moving along and you have time to think about how to react. So I think that was sort of what gave Sonic more of the perception of his edge. Uh, but I do think you're right. Like it really is like if you, especially if you remove the toe tap, it is like. A very G-rated, and he makes a razor blade sound, which is kind of badass. <laughs> That's true. That's true. I mean, it's like marketed at your older brother who's twelve. <laughs> you know, <laughs> like that's that was the marketing, right? Yeah. <laughs> okay, and wait, I wait. suspect. Sorry, to, Dave. Can we go back to what you were saying though about expectations for Detective Pikachu? Oh wait, hold Just, on. I, I, okay. I want to move on from from uh, from Pikachu because we have so many other movies I want to get to. But it's it's funny you mentioned. Maybe we can come back to it later if we have time. But it's funny you mentioned Super Mario Brothers because I definitely want to talk about Super Mario Brothers, which I was not able to watch for this panel because it is not available in digital format, which probably says something about how <laughs> eager anyone is, anyone involved with making it or owning the rights to it is to have anyone see it. Um, but I know, um, Zach, you, you've seen this, right? What's your, uh, give us your Super Mario Brothers report. Um, it's really terrible from like frame <laughs> one. Um, it, it, it's like, he's, he, he's like understating it. He's so, right. yeah. Like the, the <laughs> first frame of that movie 
looks like it was made in a program worse than Mario Paint. Like, <laughs> it, it's like a dinosaur. Like ah, it's it's really bad. But um, <laughs> I I think you know once quarantine is over. I would actually really highly recommend watching it with a group of friends while you're drinking because it is, it's so incredibly bad. And if you look into the lore of the movie, like on IMDb, Dave, I don't know if you looked at it, but like people were just drunk on set and uh, it was the two directors that did like uh, Max Headroom and they were like these cyberpunkers and they tried to, they tried to make like Mario into this cyberpunk thing. I, it, the story's nonsensical, but it's it's really kind of fun to watch. Like, like especially if you're with friends, I wouldn't recommend watching it. You know, w- during the COVID times. But yeah, well, let me just explain. So this movie was 1993, so it was pretty much the first big video game adaptation movie yep. at all. Um, Blake, have you seen Super Mario Brothers? Oh, yeah, I've seen it several times. I mean, I had to watch it for research for my book. <laughs> um, and, I, and I watched it as a kid. Uh, and, it, and it is like, you know, based on what Aaron was saying about like sort of the Nintendo identity, which is spot on. Like, it, it is like one of the, it, it is like a polar opposite of what Nintendo is all about. Like, Nintendo is all Disney, kid friendly, very G rated. And the movie itself is like inherently not that. Um, and it's not good in any way. Um, you know, I, I remember thinking at the time of writing the book that like one thing that was just, kind of interesting and sad and maybe helps explain a little bit of what happened with these video game movies is that, you know, back in the day, one of the things I liked about the video games that were being made in the 90s and even the 80s was that it was usually, uh, you know, like one, it was like two to five person teams, you know, like it was it was small groups of people that were making these games and they were cost about a million dollars or less and and whether or not they were good, at least they did sort of have like a singular vision, like we could debate whether Toe Jam and Earl is a good game, I think it is, but like it has like its own unique vibe. Like it doesn't feel like there was 55 cooks in the kitchen all wanting it to be something different. Um, and it had like a singular vision or something like that. And, and the Mario movie is like the opposite of that. The Mario movie is like so many different people trying to accomplish so many different things and you end up with nothing. And so like whether, you know, even if that movie had ended up with just like being this mythological dinosaur story, like, like Zach was sort of alluding to like the beginning is all about, like I kind of would at least respected that. Cause I, uh, you know, it would have like a through line and like a, a singular vision. And like, that's part of, maybe this is a bad piece of criteria, but like, I at least like, when there's a finished product, I at least want to know like, who's the person who's like, yes, this is the movie I wanted, or this is the story I wanted. And we can all agree or disagree with like, whether it was good. But like, I feel like a, a, a good sign that something is bad is when, when no one's taking credit. No one's <laughs> like, yeah, that was what I wanted. Cause it was like, it just gets distorted by so many people involved. I just want to read, this is uh, some research I found. So this is from a YouTube video by The Gaming Historian. I just want to read a few of these things. So fairly recently, the directors of the movie said, quote, nobody wanted to touch us. We were like lepers in Hollywood. Still to this day, I have projects and I call up managers and agents to try to represent it. And they say, you did Super Mario Brothers? Oh, God. It was like 20 years ago, but it's still there. (laughs) And then um, Bob Hoskins, who played Mario, was interviewed in The Guardian. And they asked him a bunch of questions and three of his answers were what is the worst job you've ever done super mario brothers what has been your biggest disappointment super mario brothers <laughs> and if you could edit your past what would you change i wouldn't do super mario brothers <laughs> yeah and, and the joke that i was gonna make when you said no you couldn't find it was that the estate of bob hoskins had seen to it <laughs> that it had been you know buried. <laughs> they were like roger roger rabbit just remember roger rabbit and everything will be fine <laughs> So wait, one well, other, like, wait, 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 just one other quote I want to read quickly. So they, so Dennis Hopper um, on Conan O'Brien was asked, you, was there any movie you wish you hadn't made? And he, he says, yeah, Super Mario Brothers. And he says, my six-year-old son at the time, he said, Dad, I think you're probably a pretty good actor, but why did you play that terrible guy King Koopa in Super Mario Brothers? I said, well, Henry, I did that so that you could have shoes. And he said, Dad, I don't need shoes that badly. <laughs> wow. That's amazing. <laughs> Almost certainly apocryphal, but that's fine. <laughs> Well, I, I was just going to say that, like, going back to what Aaron was talking about earlier about um, sort of the magic of Roger Rabbit, and, and it's kind of odd that it hasn't been uh, matched or, or replicated in other ways over the years. But, like, that was kind of what I thought the movie was going to be when it came out. And maybe those expectations as a kid messed it up. But, like, I thought, like, oh, wow, this is going to be, like, sort of a story into the video game world that has the Roger Rabbit guy in it. Like, that was a great way to hook me. Um, 
clearly the movie was not that. Well, cool. if you look at the plot, it's actually kind of exactly that because right. they go underground and they go into this different dimension where there are reptiles instead of humans, even though you wouldn't know because they just look like humans. But right. well, it, like, it, it kind of is. And then when they go, the the reptiles that just look like humans, when they're in the real world in New York or whatever, they're acting like crazy cartoon characters. They're like, you know, eating a hot dog, like without the bun, you know, and just, I don't know, acting crazy, like cartoons. Yeah. So. No, that's a good point. I guess it's just like the ambiance was so bet- poorly done that like, it didn't even really register with me as a kid, uh, or even now. That like that that it was like a Roger Rabbit sort of down the rabbit hole sort of movie. Uh, all right, so Zach, why don't you tell us about why everyone should go see Mortal Kombat? Um, well, I I do have nostalgia for it, but I think it's like a legitimately good movie. Um, I mean, it, the plot is not the greatest thing. It's just Enter the Dragon with like high supernatural stakes um but you know the, all yeah. the characters let's just, have let's just explain they, they, the characters all go to an island for like the ultimate martial arts tournament and where it's they fight to the death um, yeah and they're doing it to save the earth realm um because shao khan is gonna destroy it after the 10th you know thing in a row but i mean this movie has chemistry it has really great fight scenes um it has some of the greatest special effects like the goro animatronics <laughs> I, I know it, i know it's not everyone's thing and I, i'm not being like ironic i think goro's special effects are amazing to watch i really like it. it's like watching teenage mutant ninja turtles but even more intense there was like 18 like a crew of like 18 people um creating that monster and it's the last of its kind you know we didn't after 95 it was just all cg um i think the humor is great um, that movie, even back in 95, was just like, fuck racism, because, like, Cage, Johnny Cage is kind of, like, doing all these, like, weird, sexist, like, kind of racist things. Like, he ha- he hands Liu Kang his luggage, like, the first time he sees him, like, hey, can I pay <laughs> you to, like, be my, you know, b- baggage boy? And, and Liu Kang's like, yeah, sure, and just fucking tosses his luggage <laughs> in the water and i'm like this guy is awesome and then like later in the movie he's all like he's all admiring sonya blade and the Liu kang's just like you're not admiring her mind you know he's like oh she's got a beautiful mind or whatever um so i think like at the time it's kind of progressive and you know as a little kid well i mean i i can't like recommend it now but for back then it was like this guy is just this badass wearing, you know, a leather jacket, and the the American is kind of the butt of the jokes. So I wanted to be like him as a kid, you know. I had never, I wasn't, I never really played uh, Mortal Kombat. I was always kind of turned off by the digitized graphics. I was more of a Street Fighter two man myself, but uh, so I had, you know, I never Agree. saw this. Um, but uh, I actually thought this was kind of awesome. Uh, it was like watching, <laughs> yes. it was like watching a Saturday morning cartoon. Uh, and all the, like, everything was, like, super vibrant and exaggerated and fun. And, uh, and the, 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 the pounding techno soundtrack is pretty great. And, um, yeah, so I, I was surprised how much I liked this. I'm not with you, Zach, on the Goro special effects, but, <laughs> um, I did think the movie was pretty fun. Uh, Aaron, did yes. you, do you, do you, do you, do you buy this as a, uh, a progressive, uh, <laughs> Oddly I enough, mean, David, are... <laughs> I do not. Can I defend I, myself? I don't think no. there's a single way it. about it. Um, I think I would not give it. I mean, I would not give it a good score on gender or race. But that's you know, it was a product of its time. So I, I'm going to grade it on a curve for that one. Um, I just think it's some of the worst acting I've ever seen, with some <laughs> of the worst dialogue I've ever seen, some of the least convincing fight scenes I've ever seen, and the most oppressive soundtrack I've ever heard. So if you would like to see a good martial arts movie where they all go to an island and fight, I recommend Enter the Dragon, which is also cheesy, but has none of the crap. <laughs> Aaron, that soundtrack went platinum. <laughs> platinum. Dude, a lot of bad things went platinum. 
<laughs> You're breaking okay. my heart. <laughs> wait, wait, we're gonna need Blake. You need to come in here and uh, give your verdict. I mean, I don't feel like I'm. Uh, they're both right. <laughs> I feel like both things can be true. Um, I mean, especially the movie was largely targeted to to me and 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 Zach, or I guess like people who play the game and were young boys, and it was everything I wanted of all the movies yeah, on this. Not list the first one. At. Yes, the second one. Yeah, like uh, of all the movies on this list, it's also even though I loved Sonic the Hedgehog movie and Detective Pikachu and and some of the others on this list, even. Uh, even Street Fighter, but like this was the movie that I felt like was the most. As soon as you see it, you're like, yes, this actually is the most seamless transition between what the game was and what the live action version would be. Um, everything else felt a little bit distorted in some ways, good in some ways, bad. But I really loved the movie at the time. Um, I think that I, I would also agree that if you want to see a better movie, a better version of this movie, but without the awesome oppressive soundtrack, uh, which I did like, you know, see Enter the Dragon or see Bloodsport. It's basically the same thing, uh, but without the crap or, or with better acting or a little bit better done. But that doesn't, but you know, if also you have better hair, six hours. If you've seen <laughs> Bruce Lee's hair in Enter the Dragon, you know yeah. that this is a big deal. Yeah, I mean, like, but, but, I, but I really loved it. Um, and, and at the time, I feel like it was a good... Um, palette cleanser from super mario brothers movie failure um <laughs> as like games that i played and and, I, and as my uh friend the screenwriter brian nathanson likes to say he's like i'm in any time that there's a tournament so i think that that format does work pretty well and interestingly enough that was not the format for street fighter which i'm sure we'll get to which also was another movie that i really liked but like you know they could have gone that tournament route and they did not well, I, I think one thing is that, I mean, the martial arts scenes in this are probably are not amazing, but I think the lead actors, at least um, Johnny Cage and Liu Kang, were actual martial artists. And I mean, I, I, I feel like you can tell mm. that they're, they're actual martial artists. Definitely Liu Kang was a, a martial artist and his fight scenes were all excellent. Um, the guy who played Johnny Cage, I'm aware that his Wikipedia page says that he was a martial artist. I would be curious about the nitty gritty for that. Um, it sounds <laughs> like maybe he, was he had a couple of karate Wikipedia lessons. Page. <laughs> so he had, um, he definitely had stunt doubles, but um, uh, the Liu Kang actor convinced him in a lot of scenes to just do his own stunts and actually ended up with him getting hurt in a couple scenes. Um, and when they reshot, uh, so there were two added scenes, the scorpion fight scene in the nether realm, which is like that orange place or uh wherever um and then the reptile fight with uh uh Liu Kang and Reptile those were both added after the the whole film had been shot because of you know test screenings and uh Robin Shaw I think is his name um the Liu Kang actor actually choreographed those two fight scenes and they're the best ones That's cool that he choreographed it like that's impressive so that he's, you know, carrying the movie as an actor, but also being involved in that aspect. All cool. right. So, 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 yeah. So, so, so Zach really likes Mortal Kombat. <laughs> I personally really like Resident Evil, as I mentioned. I want to tell you about the first time I saw Resident Evil. So, I had just gone to a science fiction convention and I hadn't slept for like three days. And then we left the convention on Sunday and went and saw Resident Evil. And it was in an incredibly dark movie theater. And for some reason, so many people in the movie theater were, were walking in and out of the theater the whole movie. And since it was so dark, people were just constantly like stumbling and falling and like <laughs> crawling and like, you know, like trying to get into their seats. And, you know, and it was like really, really disconcerting, especially in my sleep deprived state of mind to be watching a zombie movie when like everyone in the theater is just like stumbling around, and, <laughs> you know, muttering and everything. And so, so I watched the movie and I, I actually thought it was totally awesome, but um, I wasn't sure if that was just because I was so sleep deprived. And the only, like the things I remember really hating were the um, sort of fake looking tongue monster and <laughs> this, this scene where she's just like all by herself for some reason fighting zombie dogs. Like those things stick out in my mind. It's like, oh, that was dumb. They're um, straight from the game though. Yeah, I was right about to say the only like the only positive thing I have to say it. about this is <laughs> the liquors, which is a thing from the, the game, and the dog's kinda cool. <laughs> okay, interesting. But so I I don't know, I really liked um just the, the the fact that they um they have amnesia from the nerve gas. Uh I really <laughs> liked the the scene where they get like chopped up by the lasers in the hallway, the like creepy little girl AI computer um 
and I don't know, like the uh, the whole like conspiracy involving the uh, the virus and everything. So I don't know this this just this combination of like horror viruses, AIs, and like zombies. This all like really works for me. Have you so, played the games? I played a little bit of Resident Evil Two, but that's it. Uh, yeah. And, th- and then I watched the other five Resident Evil movies. And I thought Resident Evil 2, I remember it being really bad. I, I haven't seen it in a long time. And then I remember Resident Evil 3 being kind of okay. And then they kind of get worse and worse from there. But I kept watching them. Um, but they get more and more just like exhausting CGI spectacles that make no sense. And don't seem to have a consistent mythology from installment to installment. Mm-hmm. Um, but so, 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 uh, so Zach, what do, you, what do you think about all that? Um, I disagree. I don't really like this movie, um, at all. (laughs) Um, it's crazy to me that it's the same director as Mortal Kombat. Um, and I'm shocked that it was turned into a franchise. Um, and I'm shocked that you've seen all of it or most of the franchise. I I don't know how many there are. Well, I hadn't seen the last two. I watched the last two for this panel, but I had seen four, just the first four, just for fun. And it's, it's weird because I, I love, um, Day of the Dead is like one of my favorite movies. Um, this is kind of similar to Day of the Dead. Um, I, think I, I heard that George Romero worked on some version of the script for this. Hmm. I mean, the the video game is like so good. It's like it's so atmospheric. It has such a basic setup, um, and it's Which just one this is very about? the the very first one, the, the two thousand two um, reboot. Uh, well, I mean, even the original at the time, I was very impressionable and like, I get it, it hasn't aged well, it has tank controls and that's really one of the only reasons why it's like a difficult game or that it's a horror game. But like when the dogs come crashing through the window, like basically in your first hallway scene, well, no, 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 it's in the original too. In the 96 Um, version? Yeah. Oh yeah? Um, yeah. When you're walking through the the fir- the that first hallway and they just come crashing through those windows it's just like whoa because it's been slow up until that point yeah. it's just this atmospheric kind of mystery brooding game yeah um and the, the two thousand I mean there's a ton of remakes for it there's the two thousand two there's the original and then there was one on the DS um that got rid of the tank controls uh, but it is basically just a port from the the N sixty four um I like those games and I like I, they seemed like it would be so easy to adapt, but this is just like, it's just its own thing with like amnesia. I mean, the main character like wakes up, it starts off and she wakes up. She doesn't know where she is. She doesn't know what's going on. And it ends the same exact way. She wakes up. She doesn't know what's going on. She doesn't know where she is. She busts out. And then there's like, she's in Raccoon City. Okay. I mean, well, I don't well, know. Apparently the director had an unrelated zombie script that that kind of got retrofitted into this Resident Evil movie, so maybe that you know is why it, <laughs> apparently it's not that uh, tightly you know related to the uh, to the game. But um, I don't know, Blake. You're gonna have to come in here again and settle this. Who's right? Me or no? I, I mean, I, I love being have, in this. I still have a chip too. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, I'm gonna have to give all my chips to Aaron because I I had this weird thing, <laughs> or maybe it's just an embarrassing thing. When I was a kid, I was like so scared of everything. So. I, didn't, I never saw scary movies, and even to this day, I'm like, <laughs> I feel like I have like PTSD from just seeing trailers. So I never saw the Resident Evil franchise. Hmm. So Aaron, All right. Aaron, settle this. <laughs> You're gonna have to say who's right here. Um, I'm gonna have to weigh in somewhere in between, but largely tilt towards Zach. And I think part of the issue is for sure the familiarity with the game. I will say that the 2002 reboot of the original Resident Evil is one of my top five games of all time. Um, as clunky as the controls are, it is such a wonderfully atmospheric, creepy as shit. Uh, <laughs> every, and the attention to detail from the sound your boots make on the rug to every footfall kicks up dust. The, the wood creaks. It's just, it's, it's a genuine like sort of, uh, it feels like playing a horror movie. And it was, by the way, for its time, incredibly beautiful. Um, the, the graphics were unparalleled at the time and, and really, and the soundtrack was creepy and it was a slow burn and it was legitimately a zombie movie. If I can put it that way, it was, it was a horror. Whereas I think it's tilts much more toward the action 
aspect of it. And the franchise did the same, much to my disappointment. Each successive Resident Evil game, until maybe the most recent installment, to me sort of drifted farther away from that point of view, which is a great shame because there's a lot of first-person shooters out there. There's a lot of uh, survival games out there. Um, and they didn't, there's not a lot of originality in it. And this felt, uh, the Resident Evil movie felt to me like it just had only a very passing resemblance. And so I think all of that colors my perceptions of it. That being said, I also think objectively, it's mostly pretty dumb. I think the concept of having your main security guys lose their memories in the event of a security <laughs> incident is a little dodgy. <laughs> um, I feel like a lot of their security protocols made no sense. Um, I thought that um, that some of the performances were about as subtle as a sledgehammer. And I just, I wanted, there were some things that were very creepy. Um, I thought the CGI uh, Red Queen thing was, I liked, I liked the kid. Um, but I, I just... I thought more could have been done with it. And there was just, it was a letdown of the source material, if I, I could say it that way. I mean, the, the thing about losing your memory, probably, I guess you're right. That doesn't make sense, but it's real. I think it's, I just, just the idea that the James Purifoy character was like trying to steal the virus and he made it, you know, he, he unleashed all this chaos to cover his escape. He made it all the way up to the train and then got gassed. And now he doesn't know what his plan was or who he is. And they're like, okay, we're going back into the the hive. And he's like, all right, let's go. And then he like starts like liking people, and he's like having some chemistry with uh, Mila Jovovich. And then just like three quarters of the way through the movie, he's like, oh fuck. He remembers like I like specifically did not want to be here with all the zombies, <laughs> and just and and sort of like you know switches um, sides basically at that point. I just always thought that was a really cool twist. So to me. I agree with what you're saying, but what they should have done is stripped it back to only those two characters. All of the, the umbrella SWAT team can fuck off because they don't really add anything in my opinion, um, except for maybe well, helping these guys survive. We need someone to survive. get cut up by the lasers. Yeah. Well, the gore. Okay. So maybe there's a couple of red shirts <laughs> to get cut up by the lasers. Because the lasers were freaking cool. But Although I don't understand compelling... why I didn't just do the grid thing to begin with. <laughs> yeah. Uh, because then it wouldn't feel like a video game. Um, yeah. Is that so well, anime? <laughs> It, or do you it, just save also, your weapon for the last, you know, guy? It's also very Resident Evil, though, because in Resident Evil, you get trapped in these rooms where if you get trapped in the room, you just have to watch yourself be killed. There's nothing you can do. It's like, uh, you fucked up the puzzle? Thumbs down. Watch. Here we go. So, I mean, it felt like a Resident Evil thing. That was one of the few things that, that actually did feel like something from the game. But I just think it would have been so much creepier if we spent some time in the mansion we had these two people who had no idea who they were, or how they got there, but they're zombies for some reason. And instead of like taking the elevator into the hive after 30 seconds of film, maybe we could actually more along the lines of the game. Actually, that's something that happens at the later stage. And it just opens up this mind blown, like what, what? I just think there were a lot of prospects for working with that. If that's going to be your premise, then just strip it back to that and do it well and have us give a shit what James Purifoy thinks about his motivations. 100% agree. But I do, I did like that last uh, set piece. I thought that was pretty cool. With the tongue monster? Y yeah. <laughs> All right, agree to disagree. So uh, moving on to <laughs> uh, Tomb Raider, the Tomb Raider franchise. Uh, I want to get Aaron's thoughts on this, because this is just sort of what I imagine Aaron's daily life is like. It's just sort of like <laughs> Tomb Raider. So. Yeah. It was funny. It was funny. Actually, I, w I went back and listened to the, um, the what's it? Yeah, the Valerian review that we did. And there's just the part where Aaron's like, okay, so imagine to picture this alien bazaar, just picture the Grand Bazaar in Istanbul. And it's kind of <laughs> like that. I'm like, oh, yeah, right. That <laughs> so, that opening scene in rampage where the guy's going on about how he's been to uganda and he's seen the gorillas in the wild and like well i actually have <laughs> 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 um yeah so i haven't raided a tomb recently um so which tomb raider <laughs> are we talking about we're just talking about the franchise in general well you said you thought the new one was surprisingly good I liked the new one. I do think that, I mean, it's, I'm not going to sell it as a great movie. Um, I think people who criticize it for being paint by numbers totally miss the point. It definitely is paint by numbers, but they put in the work. They put in the work in the way that the previous Tomb Raider franchise with Angelina Jolie did not. 
that franchise you open up and she's already like battling robots and running around and just generally being badass. In this one, they, they do the work of showing why Laura is capable of what she's capable of and being believable in what she's not capable of. Another criticism was that she, she gets her ass beat down too many times in this movie. And I appreciated that. I thought it was just a more grounded version of, of Tomb Raider. It still had all of the sort of features that we know and love, the missing dad and the mystery to save the universe, blah, blah. Um, but it was just done on a very human scale and it was credibly acted and they put in the work with the characters. And also, I just think Walton Goggins should be in all the things. He should be in everything. All the Let's things. just do a side podcast. Like, I just, <laughs> I've been watching Justified and S.H.I.E.L.D. back oh, and forth just because I want Walton so Goggins in my life. I don't even think Justified, for me, it's not that great, but I just love watching him. <laughs> I, so I have a thing that. for Timothy Oliphant. Anyway. <laughs> I mean, I think that the new Tomb Raider, I thought the execution was pretty good. I think, you know, um, Alicia Vikander is good. I think the cinematography is good and everything. My my, my issue with this is like I already saw Indiana Jones in The Last Crusade. And so many of these kind of like adventure yes. treasure hunting movies, but there's no value added proposition. I agree with you. Indiana Jones. But, but can I just chime in on, on just that point specifically? It, it, I totally agree with you, but I do think you have to grade this one on a curve because the franchise is based on Indiana Jones, really. So it's kind of hard to criticize it. It's like it's based on a source material that's based on a source material. So I think that resemblance, if it's going to bear any meaningful resemblance, I do think they, they hit the last crusade specifically a little too hard. Um, in some of the details, but it has to it's, be Indiana Jones or it's not Tomb Raider. It's so derivative that it's it seems like it's more based off of Uncharted than it is based off of Indiana Jones. I mean, there's like a, a set piece that is beat for beat, an Uncharted set piece with the her in the in the plane at, uh, on, you know, before it goes over the waterfall. I mean, that's just Uncharted. I've Which seen is... that in a few movies, I feel like. Hmm. You're not helping your case with that observation. I mean, I wasn't suggesting it was original. I believe <laughs> I described it as paint by numbers. <laughs> she did say that. I, I have a question. Uh, so I have an observation and then sort of a question for you guys querying Indiana yeah, Jones. But, you know, I, I think that, uh, um, like, like Aaron said, I, I, re I really liked, I liked the reboot a lot more than the other two. And also, I, I liked it when you're grading against the curve of the game and also the, the curve of what those other movies were. And I think that what I really liked about this one was that it does a credible job of delivering the art origin story of Lara Croft, whereas the other two, uh, the other ones, exactly. at least especially, didn't. Um, which made me then think like, okay, I, I do love origin stories. I'll cop to that. Um, that's often what I like to write. Um, but then I was thinking, wow, that's kind of interesting because like Indiana Jones could have gone the origin story route, but it doesn't. It starts off with, he's like already you know, we're we're just on another adventure with him. So, why? I guess my question for you guys is, why do you think Indiana Jones was so successful and not an origin story? Like, like, how come we just bought immediately that he was this guy, or that it wasn't necessary to sort of understand how he became this, you know, archaeologist adventurer? Um. Well, I I have two responses to that. One is that I think Indiana Jones doesn't in that first movie, other than some very impressive flourishes with the whip, which I think Indy doesn't fully get credit for his facility with that whip, which is pretty mind blowing. <laughs> but other than that, um, I honestly don't think that we felt the need or feel the need to justify the awesomeness of an alpha male protagonist. Okay. He just is. We can something, something special forces, something, something PhD in, in archeology, span good enough, done and dusted. Where if you have this, this tiny 20 year old, uh, female protagonist, you do have to, I think, for most audiences, um, and you know, I'm, I'm not, I'm not defending it, but I, I do think that you, they, they feel obliged, rightly or wrongly, to justify uh, why she's awesome. I prefer origin stories in general. I would have liked to know how Indy got to be Indy, and I think lots of people did, which is why they ended up doing prequel stuff. See, I had kind of the exact opposite reaction with this movie is that I, I'm I'm pretty burned out on origin stories, especially after mm. all the superhero <laughs> origin stories. And I, I found the whole, the whole thing fair. with her like riding the bike with the paint and the whole like thing with her dad. Where it's like, for, also, it was just driving me crazy that her dad's been like 
dying on this island for seven years or something <laughs> while she, when she should, could, have, could have just signed the papers and like gone and helped him seven years ago. But leaving that aside. <laughs> so, but I, I, I thought that this should have been like way more like the, I, the part where this movie really came alive to me is there's this really brief sequence where she's like sneaking around the camp with the bow and arrow and the camera's kind of following her. And I was like, man, this whole movie should have been, it should have been like, um, 1917 or uh, children of men or something where she just like wakes up on the beach and then like an hour and a half later she's like raiding the tomb and we just were with her every moment and it's just like you know the camera's just falling along and she's just like knifing people and like shooting people with bows and arrows and none of the stuff with the dad or like whatever was interesting to me at all i just want to see like like her being a badass on an island with like drug dealers and booby traps <laughs> I had the exact same reaction. It was at like the 40 minute mark when the ship crashed. And I looked over at Taylor and I was like, this is when this movie should have started because the, the, all of the other stuff is actually, it's really boring. Like it's boring to watch the, the set pieces are bad. Her riding around on her bike. That's boring. Her running from muggers. That's boring. Um, yeah, a hundred percent agree. And, and I think the reason, like, you were feeling that bow and arrow part is, like, that straight ripped from the 2015 game, the or I think it was 2015, the reboot. It's so, it was very similar to that. Um, and, yeah, it's really good. <laughs> should check it out. Yeah. See, I think, for me, one of the things that I really liked about and I don't know if this is this is a good thing to like about them or not, but the ones that appealed to me the most were the tended to be, this is not across the board, uh, doesn't apply to Mortal Kombat, for example, but tended to be the ones that hewed most closely to, to the video game material. And if if it's just going to be Lara in the bushes fighting a bow and arrow, I'm just going to go play Tomb Raider. If I'm going to see the movie, I want a little more depth to it. I want to to attach myself to the character and care about who she is and why she's doing what she's doing. Um, because otherwise, particularly with the technology being what it is, in so many of these games now, it is like playing a movie. Where's the added value of doing a movie adaptation if you're if you're not going to put in the character development? I actually, I'm really glad you said that because I was thinking that back to how I felt at the time in '96 when the first or whenever the first movie came out, and I remember thinking, like, I'd rather just be playing the game, like, because 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 Angelina Jolie was such a perfect. She seemed to be such a perfect um, iteration of Lara Croft, like exactly like the game. It was like, oh, there's someone in real life just like that, and and her doing this stuff. I was just, it just made me want to play the game. I felt like, why is this movie happening? This is just the, like, as if I was watching a walkthrough of the game, but I'd rather just be playing the game. I just, you know, it's do the the first movie was 2001. I just went back okay. and rewatched it, and I actually thought it was pretty fun and there's just like one i mean a lot most of it i think is like kind of not that interesting but there's just one sequence where she's like i don't know every night apparently she like bungee jumps off her balcony in her mansion and she just happens to get attacked by a commando team in the middle of that and it's just like <laughs> bouncing all around the room killing people and i was like this is pretty badass uh and <laughs> um uh you know so it's so it's almost like if someone asked me which one should you watch i'm like the new one is a much better movie objectively speaking but the old one is like gonzo in a way that kind of makes it worth watching at this point <laughs> when, when when i'm saying like the new one doesn't really i'm not sure why i wouldn't just play tomb raider or watch indiana jones instead um and then cradle of life you can fucking skip that one that's garbage yeah, I actually really like the 2000, well, I, sorry, not really like, but I'm definitely leaning on the 2001 one just because, I mean, it has Sir Jorah Mormont in it, and he's like, <laughs> he's the worst even die job hot. ever. <laughs> he's like all but riding on a palanquin throughout this movie, <laughs> like being fed grapes. He's so like mustache twirly. And then the very end, like the stakes are super high and cheesy and like, in the 2018 one, it's just like, it's this boring, I mean, are, we're going into spo spoilers, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, zombie, like, science-y zombies, come on, that was just, I, I was like, I just rolled my eyes. Um, because it just, it felt predictable, it felt like, so what, you know? So there's a zombie virus, who cares? Um, seen that a million times. Um, but then I, I get the same thing with pausing time, but like when she pauses time and she spins that dagger around, I mean, I thought that was 
I thought that was cool. I think it's a cool image. Yeah. I mean, it's it a, cool. it, it's stupid, but it's a lot of fun. Also, you get to see uh, Daniel Craig as like a young, kind of almost dweeby guy. But still jacked. <laughs> he he, yeah. he does yeah. nothing in that movie. Like John Voight. I just can I just shout out for John Voight, who's one of my my favorites. I uh, I like I like I I guess they were still speaking then. I I don't know that they. <laughs> Are well, you? I don't know if they were split still speaking because they had zero chemistry, which is weird. But yeah, but I mean, she wouldn't consent to have her dad cast as her dad if they weren't, you know. Yeah. Were right. they? Yeah. Anyway, that was kind of why I thought it was an earlier movie, but I guess that was more recent. Oh, right. and I'll say this, and this is like oh, so many of these movies have uh, like slow mo. Um, especially these older movies, please, directors, get a high-speed lens camera to do your slow-mo. I'm tired of looking at 15 frames a second slow-mo on, like, all of these movies, except for Mortal Kombat. They got a high-speed <laughs> high camera, man. You see his, like, hair looks awesome in slow-mo. <laughs> oh, Liu Kang's hair should have its own show. It should. All right, uh, Rampage. Uh, Blake, did you watch Rampage? I did, but I don't really have that much to say about it. It was like, <laughs> eh, it was like. Did it bring back memories of playing the arcade game? <laughs> not at all. In the early eighties. <laughs> I loved that game. It, I felt like this had not, this had like almost nothing to do with the game, but it was just an interesting rock Dennis Johnson movie. Yeah, if you don't know, so there was this old arcade called Rampage, where you know there were three spots for players to stand at the arcade, and one one controlled like, um, like a Godzilla kind of monster. One controlled a giant werewolf. And one control the giant gorilla, um, and so they kind of took that, you know. I mean, there are there are those monsters in this uh, in this movie. Um, I, I, I you know I, I didn't like love this movie at all. Although I did think that Dwayne Johnson made a surprisingly believable primatologist. I would never have <laughs> imagined. No, no, I would never have imagined I would say that. But I, 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 wait, 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 I totally believed that he loves that gorilla, which, especially <laughs> considering it was a CGI gorilla, I think is a pretty impressive acting feat. So, um, you didn't think that you didn't believe that he loved that gorilla? I thought I, I believe totally there's more to being a primatologist than loving a gorilla. His, <laughs> his sole motivation is get your hands off my man's. No military is taking down my my pal George, and I yeah. It's it's super fun to watch, and he he fist bumps a giant gorilla. Everything he <laughs> does awesome. in that movie is such like gorilla one hundred and one. Never do this. <laughs> it's gonna tear your arms out of your sockets and beat you to death with them. Anyway, that's fine. It's not supposed to be realistic. See, Aaron's just bringing her knowledge of the real world to Look, kill our fun. <laughs> listen, I think if you have you ever even seen a gorilla in a zoo. <laughs> like if you've ever seen a gorilla I, in a zoo there's going to be have, signs I everywhere that say don't make eye contact with the gorilla yeah but if you have a special bond with the gorilla all no. rules are off come on when you're the alpha male i mean you make eye contact with whoever you want to when you're the alpha <laughs> yeah two two points one i'm not dwayne johnson two those gorillas i saw in the zoo did not speak sign language uh -huh. it's closed <laughs> okay um all right so leaving aside the issue we're going to have to agree to disagree on whether Dwayne Johnson is a believable primatologist. But uh, <laughs> leaving that aside, uh, oh, I also thought the scene with, okay, well, let me say, I hated the um, brother, sister, who apparently run the biggest corporation on earth by themselves from their office without talking to anybody else. Um, <laughs> but I did love this. The, they, they have this totally badass um, corporate mercenary guy and his team who go to hunt the giant wolf. Oh, Joe. And, and they all get killed by the giant wolf. And that was by far my favorite part of the movie. I thought but, that sequence was pretty badass. I might have liked it, but it's the, see, I was like, I hated the movie from the opening scene with the stupid guy talking about Uganda and everything they did with the gorillas. And it was just, I hated it. And then Joe came on and I was like, oh, Joe, are you going to, are you going to fix the movie just by being you? Because obviously if you're going to have an alpha male in your movie, that's the one. And then he gets bitten in half, like right away. That's no, but I thought that waste. was cool because because they set him up. They set him up because he's so badass, and then he dies right away. You're like, holy I, shit, this wolf is fucking serious. It's terrifying. Like that. Like just the concept of a giant wolf. It's just like I don't dinosaurs. No, I don't care about dinosaurs. Giant wolves. 
apex predators. Those things are scary. <laughs> that, wasn't it amazing that the satellite blew up? That the skate pod blew up, and then all three pieces not only landed on the continental United States from space, but they all landed within a few feet of apex predators. Like, pfft, mind blown right there. Some amazing scripting. Aaron, where, <laughs> what other movie are you going to watch where a giant wolf jumps at a helicopter that's shooting it with a giant machine gun and the wolf wins? You know what, Dave? None. I am. You got me there. You got me there. But you know, if it's like you took two good movies and you smashed them together and you created a piece of shit, that's what happened. <laughs> you took Jurassic Park and you smashed it against King Kong, and this is what we came up with. No. Uh. -uh. uh so, so Blake, you said you didn't have much to say about this movie, but did any anything I just said there inspire any uh, any more thoughts from you? Well, I'm just curious. Did did. I felt like the marketing did not uh, make clear to me that this was a video game movie at the time. I remember feeling that way. Did you guys feel that way? Agree. Like, yeah. yes. I, it, it wasn't until I, like, like, I think someone told me, but like, why do you think that was? Of every other video like, game movie here, it's kind of like. I don't think enough people remember Rampage at this point that it would make, that it would be really a selling point, which is kind of like, why did they make the movie at all? But... Yeah, which is like, why did they make the movie? <laughs> Great why not just. <laughs> <laughs> I was thinking was... about the the actual, you know, game and the the struck like the plot of this movie and like the just the plot of a lot of other kaiju movies and they're always trying to like humanize Godzilla at least in these later ones. And it I it never works for me. It, I don't really care for kaiju movies. Um but uh, Colossal was amazing. I think it's like it's my favorite kaiju movie and it's because the people are kaiju you know so it's it's literally they're humans and it, i'm pretty sure when you get a game over in rampage they shrink down into little little bitty naked humans and they walk off screen oh, so i was thinking that. why why wouldn't they kind of work that into the plot you know make a human morphing monster it seems like it would be much more interesting and just since you mentioned kaiju, Zach, I, I just, lest I create the impression that I am not down with gleefully ridiculous movies, I loved Pacific Rim. I loved the shit out of that movie. I thought mm. it was great. It was ridiculous and it was bad, but it was also awesome. So I can totally get, and Dwayne Johnson is a great pick for being the, the star behind a gleefully stupid movie. Um, and I just, it just wasn't, it wasn't gleeful enough. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know exactly where it failed, except everywhere. Yeah, it wasn't. It wasn't amazing, but it had its moments. I like how the bad guys too, like the 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 brother, look like. And I swear, this must have been what they were going for. But he looked like a cross between Don Jr. and Eric, and then the sister <laughs> just looked like Melania. I swear, like, and they were they were really playing it up. And when I when they were just playing it up, I just I don't know. I was more forgiving and jeffrey dean morgan is like i'm a crazy cowboy yeah, <laughs> um, underutilized which is cool again uh, also love jeffrey dean morgan um un underutilized i didn't get the, the the trump thing but that's interesting you know who he reminded me of for some reason this is probably not gonna it's not gonna chime with many people he reminded me of troy from the goonies anyone troy no Okay. I, I don't. I don't know. No. Troy, Troy, who's, Troy, who's Troy from the Goonies? He's the guy with the bucket. Troy is the 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 asshole son of the rich property developer who wants to steal the Goonies' houses. So he's the guy who's dating um, um, Andy, who is in love with Brand. Anyway, look, if you're not a Goonies junkie, this isn't going to mean anything to you. So forget <laughs> I said it. All right, let's uh, move on to Silent Hill before we run out of time. So, Zach, you were saying that um, you have a bunch of friends who are all like, oh, you should watch Silent Hill for this. So I did. I went and watched Silent Hill. Um, so why don't you, first of all, just say, like, um, what do you think of Silent Hill? Um, so I watched it in back when it came out, um, but I don't really have a good memory of it because I wasn't really paying attention. Um, but re-watching it, I... I thought it was pretty cool. I mean, it's by far the best uh, cinematography, in, in my opinion, of all these movies. Um, the The plot is like, there's an actual plot to this movie. Um, the set pieces are creepy as hell. Um, 
I mean, I, and I, I think it, it's not a perfect movie, but it stands up to rewatches. Um, it, I, there is like a big info dump at the end that is going to turn off a lot of people, but um, I think it can be interpreted in a couple of ways, just like the Silent Hill game endings. Um, yeah, I, I dug it. I think it's probably the best adaptation, um, but it's not my favorite. Yeah, I uh, have no real, really no familiarity with the game at all. The premise is that there's a woman and she adopted this little girl who's very troubled and keeps having nightmares and talking about Silent Hill, this town in Pennsylvania. And so the mother decides, well, maybe if she goes to this town, it'll help solve the mystery of, of why her daughter's, um, you know, having these nightmares and everything. And so she goes to the, t she, she sort of takes the daughter to the town against her husband's wishes. And the town is this, uh, it's, um, uh, there was like a mine fire or something. And so the, the town's abandoned and there's ash drifting down. You know, it's like the mine has been on fire for years and there's ash drifting down. And then every once in a while, and there's like weird people kind of living in the rubble. And then every once in a while, this um, like fire siren sounds. And when that happens, like the town turns into like this weird, dark, like industrial version of hell and m monsters come out. And then that lasts for like, you know, 20 minutes or something and then things go back to normal so all that stuff was pretty cool um i thought the movie was really too long it's like i think it's like it's over two hours long um and so I, I found the beginning pretty involving and i thought the end was actually pretty intense and and cool and uh i think i thought they should have cut the the middle down a lot but uh but yeah it was all right um, I, I just I love how, like, at the, I mean, it's just my ideology, but I just love the ending sequence where it's, like, the church doors, like, their, you know, their religion keeps them from, like, it, it kills them. You know, they can't escape this wrath. And I just thought that was so cool and gross and visceral. Yeah, lots of, like, very, like, anti-religion kind of. Yeah. So, I mean, I'm all about that <laughs> yeah yeah high five um <laughs> did uh blake or aaron did you either of you watch this nope yeah i saw it uh you know i, I mentioned earlier that horror movies and that sort of oh yeah, atmosphere. yeah it's not my I thing to, but i didn't mean to <laughs> no but i did watch it but i <laughs> but I, I i i agree with zach like is uh, of all the films on this list that it's, it's probably like the most beautifully made or beautifully shot at least um so i appreciate it from that aspect but the you know the story itself was just i, I think like it sounds good when you describe it and you bring it down like that but it just wasn't for me but i think it was like i would give credit to the director and the cinematographer i think they made a nice version of the story that they were telling yeah um all right so we've got a little extra time here so aaron you had something else you wanted to say about pikachu Oh, I, I mean, I don't know if it's worth going back to. I just thought that um, Detective Pikachu could have made such a great modern day Roger Rabbit if they had gone with that that noir, uh, hard boiled detective um, ethos to it. Um, I think it, that's a really good fit for Ryan Reynolds. Um, you know, Deadpool obviously has a, a lot of that that narration over top of it, which makes it really good. This could have been a sort of PG version of that. Um, and I would have liked it. And I think Ryan Reynolds is kind of an interesting choice um, and is probably, I guess what I was going to say about that when you were talking is that's possibly what tweaked your brain into thinking this was going to be a more adult movie than it ended up being was because um, was because they cast Ryan Reynolds in it. But, but if there was extra time, I, I did maybe want to kick around the idea of. Um, Wait, I have actually have something else about Pikachu. I okay. could, I could add there. I did actually speaking of whether it's like for kids or adults. I did actually think the climax was kind of horrifying, and I wondered if it was would scare like young kids. Um, and so actually, I thought that part was kind of cool. I mean, overall, I thought that this this reminds me a lot of Zootopia, which I actually really love. And I kind of feel like you know you could just watch Zootopia, and it's pretty much the same except better. Mm. But um. I you know the the ending sequence um is like really kind of like grotesque and weird and uh that was the one part of the movie where I was kind of like except I did like I did like the the Pikachu's jokes and stuff um but but I was I was kind of bored by the movie overall but the that ending part I was like wow this is getting like a lot weirder and than I was expect scarier than I was expecting it to 
it it did seem kind of like a save the city Marvel, you know, CG big battle, you know, including Mewtwo is like literally flying around like a superhero, which I was just like, uh, okay. <laughs> but, um, yeah. All right, cool. So Aaron, what, what else you wanted to bring up something else? Well, I just thought, I mean, f- for me, it, it's striking that some of my favorite movies to do with video games are not based on real video games. And then on the flip side, some of my favorite video games that I think would make amazing movies have not yet been adapted. And I'm kind of curious as to why, particularly when some of them are some of the biggest properties out there um, in terms of, uh, yeah, in terms of games. So So, so like what? um, In the first category, well, I mean, we don't need to talk about the first category. Obviously, Tron is the greatest video game movie ever made that was never a video game movie. I loved that original Tron. But um, but yeah, I'm just kind of surprised there haven't been any attempts. Um, the, the first time I played a video game that I sort of consciously felt like I was playing a movie was Prince of Persia, Sands of Time. Um, they didn't make that. I know they talked about it, and there were rumors that Jake Gyllenhaal was going to play the Prince of Persia for some reason. <laughs> but that never happened. So I would totally like to see that. Um, Uh, We didn't talk about Assassin's Creed, which I thought uh, would have been another one on the list that uh, was had a lot of potential, but didn't quite cut it. But um, in terms of ones that haven't been attempted at all, I'm a bit surprised that none of the Bioware properties have been uh, Mm, have been tapped, especially uh, both Dragon Age and Mass Effect obviously have a lot of potential. Um, I'm also a little surprised no one's tried to make The Legend of Zelda even as an anime cartoon. An anime cartoon? Did I just say that? Anyways, uh, I think it, I think it does have some anime adaptations in feature in the, film. No, not feature like a Saturday morning. Oh yeah, no that 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 wouldn't surprise me. Um, it's just it's interesting to me to kind of question uh, why certain properties get tapped and and others not. But yeah, certainly Mass Effect and Dragon Age both strike me as being um, good candidates for a variety I, of reasons. I, I mean, but Mass Effect is so similar to a lot of TV and film. Like, it's it's derivative of a lot of, you know, Star Wars and um, Star Trek. You know, it's almost just like a complete combination of the two. So is Warcraft, and, right? Yeah, but that didn't make a great movie, right? I mean, <laughs> no, that's, no, that's why I'm like... it didn't make a great movie, but it didn't stop them from making a movie either. Yeah. And, and then same thing with Dragon Age, right? Dragon Age is, like, it's derivative of a lot of these, like, high, you know, fantasy things. And I'm not sure. I think what's great about those games is they're super char- character-driven and you get into their lore, into their, like, side missions and stuff. But, like, a bunch of side missions, like, the plot of Mass Effect and the plot of Dragon Age are not great. But what makes those great games are like the plot of the characters. Those like little sub, those little mini missions that you do. And I don't know if they would be able to like translate that into like a proper, you know, movie. Maybe like a TV show. I think it would be I, tough. I think it would be tough, but I think I think it's definitely doable. Um, I, I think precisely because they're so character driven is what makes them good candidates. Um, I'm less familiar with the Mass Effect lore than I am the the Dragon Age lore. Um, but as far as the latter goes, it's super derivative on the surface. But the deeper you get into it, the the more original material is there. Be- just because I think they've been writing it for some, some of these games are now, of course, decades old. Um, I think there's a lot of potential for an original plot that goes up, does a little more of a deep dive for some of the franchise's more popular characters. I think people would go for that, but and I think there's a lot of potential to to do it. See, Blake, do you have any uh, games that you would want to see made into movies? Uh, kind of like Aaron hinted at. I mean, I know the answer is partially just because it's Nintendo stuff. Nintendo is so protective with their IP. I would love to see many of the movies I'd like to see are based on Nintendo properties because I think that Nintendo does character and atmosphere better than any um, – uh, usually does better than anybody else. And whether it's fr- family, fun-friendly stuff like Kirby or whether it's an epic series or, or epic movie like Legend of Zelda with or something about Link or Hyrule, like that's what I would love to see. Yeah. I would love to see a Bionic Commando movie, but only if it has Hitler in it, which I think <laughs> it probably unlikely that Nintendo would do you, for that. Do you think maybe Jojo Rabbit has cracked the seal on Hitler? 
<laughs> it's like that vault has been closed for a while, but we're now. Anyway. Yeah, it's fair game. I would love to see a Metal Gear Solid movie because Metal Gear Solid is like this That's strange amalgam yeah, of like espionage and, but with the sensibilities of anime. So, you know, and the, the visual flares of anime, I think, translate, could translate really well to a live action. Um, with, you know, that more American plot that Hideo Kojima is, like, obsessed with. Um, yeah, I think that would make a really cool movie. And you can you could do just one movie, you know? The, yeah. it, like, The Shadow Moses is just one movie. It, it, whether it's Mass Effect or Metal Gear or Zelda or any of the ones we've been talking about, would you guys rather see them as movies or as limited series slash TV shows. Cause I feel like I, I would want them to expand out, but that's also probably indicative of the kind of stories I like, like I always just like longer I'm curious what you guys would well, prefer. I think it depends on the thing, but okay. I mean, I was just about to say Bioshock and I feel like Bioshock would be a good feature film. Yeah. Did anyone ever play eternal darkness? No, I did no, not know. Nothing, nothing. They were supposed to make a sequel and they never did. Uh, that was a great one. Anyways, if any of you out there played Eternal Darkness, I think that would make a rad movie. Expensive, though. Because the ba <laughs> the basic concept there is that you're... Um, it's similar to Assassin's Creed in the sense that you've got some uh, juxtaposition of different timelines with ancestors um, who are all working to fight the same agent evil, etc. But what's fun about it is you do get these... Um, all these different environments. So at some point you're a Roman centurion and at another point you're in Cambodia and blah, blah, blah. It's, it's, it's a lot of fun and, and super spooky. I would love to see an Ultima movie, but I, I know that's not going to happen because I don't think enough young people like are familiar with the series at this point, but that would oh, be yeah. so great. Then again, Rampage was made and I would have thought that was yeah, came and went. Yes. Yeah, that's a good point. Um, and then, of course, Monkey Island. I'd love to see. Although the Ooh, um, Pirates of the Cari the first Pirates of the Caribbean movie is basically a Monkey Island movie, but I'd still like to see an actual Monkey Island movie. And there are maybe others. Like a lot of it comes down to writing. I would never, you would never have convinced me that Sonic the Hedgehog would be anything <laughs> other than a trash fire. Like I just would not have believed that that could in any way translate into even a competent movie. And um, yeah, and it did so. Yeah, and if you extrapolate current trends, we can predict video game movies in, uh, you know, 10 years to be over 70% on Rotten Tomatoes. <laughs> <laughs> yes. So yes. there's a couple that are coming up that, you know, one of them doesn't look great, but like um, there's going to be a Monster Hunter movie based off of the Capcom game called Monster Hunter, um, but it's unfortunately directed by Paul W.S. Anderson, <laughs> Anderson, and it's starring Mila Jovovich. And um, I looked at the synopsis, and it's like, I, I, have any of y'all played Monster Hunter? No. no. Does the screenplay involve a team of commandos with amnesia going into an underground bunker? It's a team of commandos and then getting going, <laughs> basically going into the Monster Hunter video game world, which is basically like... Jumanji. You, 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 I mean, they're, they're like little dwarf they're like little miniature kaiju that you fight in that game and you it's all about looting and fighting um it's like an action uh it's an action game um but it's like you use swords and you know you set traps and it's all this like like intricate stuff you know you have to like every battle is a boss battle and they're all 30 minutes long and then there's no guns or anything like that or you know it's all like its own world, and then, you know, it's just this, Mila Jovovich is going to have, you know, a grenade launcher, and, and like, a, a Humvee, and she's going to be riding around, it's like, man, I don't ones. want to see that shit, um, but there's going to be a new Mortal Kombat movie coming out, and <laughs> I'm, a, I'm ex really excited about that, because it's got, like, a bunch of actors from, that are, like, stunt performers, people that were in the raid, and, um, other, like, highly regarded action like movies like violent kung fu movies and it's going to get the r rating you know it's going to be you know hopefully more even more like the source material which is more violent than you know the 95 movie all right so we're uh, we're all out of time here so we're gonna have to start getting into some final thoughts 
So, Blake, any final thoughts on this whole subject of uh, video game adaptations? Um, uh, we didn't talk about Street Fighter. That was one of my favorites that was on this list. Um, I guess my my final thought. This is something I've thought about for a while, especially because uh, back when Console Wars came out in 2014, I was often asked why video game movies don't work, and obviously they have since worked. Or don't quite work. Um, you know, for me, it, uh, it's it's often about the origin stories and it's about the characters, and so I have a I think I have little interest or less interest in seeing movies where the main character is is your first person point of view. So whether it's Assassin's Creed or or even like Bioshock, which has great atmospheric storytelling. Like I'm much more interested in seeing adaptations where, which is typically, you know, mostly stuff from the nineties uh, of where you're actually, you know, the character, like I know what Mario looks like and sounds like, and it's not me. Um, and I want to see that translated. So I guess that's just something I've thought about more during this conversation of what, of where my interests lie in the kinds of adaptations I prefer to see. Uh, Aaron, final thoughts. Uh, final thoughts. Um, I, another property I'd love to see adapted is Diablo. Loved that franchise. That's I like that idea. That's really good. Um, I, yeah, I think I think that uh, in general, I, there's no in principle reason why video game movies couldn't work, and the proof of that is that there are movies about video games that have worked very well. Um, like I mentioned, Tron and, and Wreck It Ralph that we talked about, and the 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 Rock Jumanji film with Jack Black was was pretty decent. Like you can make movies that work within the frameworks of a video game. I think they just largely haven't got there yet. And I have a certain degree of sympathy for why, because there's, you know, you need to be faithful to the source material to, to please a certain constituency, but then you also can't be completely constrained by that. Or you'll have people like me saying, I would rather just play the game. So, you know, I think it's, it's tricky to get right for sure. Um, I have faith that they will, but by and large, they have not done so yet. Well, yeah, I mean, it really seems like a lot of times they're just thinking, oh, millions of people play this game. They would go see a movie about this without Even actually having a good idea yeah. for what the movie should right. be. Yeah. Well, like, didn't Sonic and um, Detective Pikachu feel like they were scripts that were written before, you know, it's like, hey, write this generic ass script and then we're going to fish around for some IP and then once we get it, we'll will control F and control, you know, <laughs> replace whatever furry creature with, you know, the main character of this franchise. You know, it's like... No. Uh, definitely I mean, Pikachu uh, didn't Sonic? feel that way to me. I mean... Sonic, I, uh, so Sonic, I feel like, could have definitely done better than it did. But I think that that uh, the the overall conflict with, with Dr. Robotnik was there in terms of his like obsession with all of his robots. And I like that they, they were very clever about incorporating some elements of the gameplay, like with the rings and, and all of those robots looked like things you wanted to hit with your spinning Sonic. <laughs> um, and I but wait, but Zach, you, well you didn't actually see the Sonic movie though. I thought, right. Oh no. I, I mean, I didn't see it in theaters. Sorry, but I, uh, okay. you know, I and I didn't watch, you know, I, I but I, you know, I'll do my research if I'm going to be on the panel. <laughs> <laughs> fair enough, fair enough. Well, but I, I agree, though, that, you know, I don't know if, if exactly it was a Control-F situation, but I, I do agree <laughs> that so many of these movies, I feel like the screenwriters are kind of like, let's just take a good movie that's similar to this, like Indiana Jones. Yeah, or ET, and retcon it. And we're just going to, like, you know, make it, take the same right. exact story, except make it this character, rather than you know, striking out and doing something, you know, interesting or imaginative. There's a, a 2011 movie with James Marsden that's called Hop, and it has a CG rabbit, and James Marsden is <laughs> traveling across the country, you know, and it's just like, it's the same thing. It's like, well, well, what holiday is it? Fuck it. We'll put in the Easter rabbit. And, you know, well, what what year is it? Okay, well, we'll pick Sonic's been dead for 20 years. Let's revive that shit. So... Yeah. Yeah, I mean, but on the other hand, those have ended up being more successful as films than some of the ones that have more uh, idiosyncratic storylines like Sands of Time or Assassin's Creed that they it's they just got so bent out of shape that they didn't really meaningfully resemble a good movie or the video game by the end of it. Yeah, right. Well, have you, have you guys ever heard of this uh, a, a augmented reality game called Pokemon Go? 
Mm, yes, I believe I have. <laughs> Unfortunately. Yeah. No, okay, well, ha, ha, did you play the uh, augmented reality game Ingress? Because, like, basically it's very similar, but one has the Pokemon IP and one doesn't. So yeah. I think that sort of explains why, um, you know, to actually get it made, you need Pokemon. So um, I think that you might be onto something. But it's not as much a Control-F situation as, like, uh, the only way to get it made situation. But then the stories are, you know, not all, you know, not all that revolutionary. All right, we need to wrap this up, so I'm going to give Zach the final word here. <laughs> um, well, I think these writers need to give a shit about <laughs> what they're adapting. Um, Always you know, I would, <laughs> I, yes. I would hope that these people are playing the games. You know, um, I looked up on the on Silent Hill, and the the game was important to the director. He'd been trying to get. Um, he had he had already made a script, and he'd been trying to adapt it for years before he got the IP. So, you know, he gave a shit. Um, and I think that that's the most successful. Well, I think it's the best one. It's not the most successful one, but it's the the best of these movies that I just watched. But again, not my favorite. I'm partial to Mortal Kombat just because I grew up with it, watching it a million times. But um, yeah, uh, hopefully these writers will play these games and and these studios will give these franchises to people who really like the source material and are, you know, kind of like nerds about it. Um I think that would go a long way to making like good movies. Totally. BioWare call me. <laughs> Yes. All right, yes. So I think that's a good note to end on. <laughs> Secret formula. Hire people who give a shit. <laughs> um, all right. So we've been speaking with Aaron Lindsay, Zach Chapman, and Blake J. Harris. So thanks, everyone, so much for joining us. Thank you. It was fun. Thank you. Thanks. And that was our panel. So big thanks again to Aaron Lindsay, Zach Chapman, and Blake J. Harris for joining us on the show. And remember that Geek's Guide to the Galaxy is made possible thanks to support from listeners like you. So if you enjoyed the show and want it to continue, please sign up to give us a dollar or two per episode over at patreon.com slash geeks. And if you'd rather make a one-time contribution, you can do that via check or PayPal over at geeksguideshow.com slash crowdfunding. So big thanks again to everyone who's contributed. We really appreciate it. All right, so that was our show. So thanks everyone for listening, and we'll see you next time. The Geek's Guide to the Galaxy is a production of Wired.com. For more information about the show, visit geeksguideshow.com. To learn more about your host, visit davidbarkirtley.com. Music and voiceover produced by yours truly, Jack Kincaid. If you enjoyed this program, tell your friends. If you didn't enjoy it, tell no one. Thank you for listening.